Today, we're going to talk about Karen Reed. Greg, tell us about the videos we're going to watch. So this video interview, and it was a very short one, and we're going to have very short clips, was from Nightline, ABC Nightline. We've also talked to the guys at Dateline. We're trying to get their video, and I don't know that we'll ever see it. But this is the only published interview with her to date. She's on trial for the murder. I think it's manslaughter, murder two, that she's been charged with in Boston courts for the death of a Boston police officer. Really good, interesting one. Her boyfriend. You're alleging that law enforcement officials in this state committed murder and that they're covering it up. Why would they want to be involved in this? Because he's dead. I, I think things went too far. It was late. There was alcohol involved, but they're all family. And there's, there's many of them involved. After posting bail, Reed has spent much of the past 18 months in and out of court awaiting a trial date. And me and my family and my attorneys and my team have marshaled every resource to get to the truth. It just feels like no one else wants it. Prosecutors allege that Reed hit O'Keefe with her car after getting into an argument earlier in the day, leaving him to die in the middle of a snowstorm in January 2022. But Reed says she had no reason to harm her boyfriend. I would call him the patron saint of Canton. He was just very selfless, frugal, and I think you'd be hard pressed to find anyone that didn't care for John. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, okay, look, straight off with this one. Let's just say it's super tight cuts here. It's choppy, it's all over the place, but it is what it is. I mean, it's it's the best we have at the moment. And so we've been holding off looking at it, but we'll look at it, but just it's choppy. So, you know, there's an issue there. You know about that. But what have we got? Well, really tight body language, not only in the whole of the body, but in the face as well, locked down, but it's choppy. So we don't know what's happening before and after, but so we're going to take that as a baseline. I don't know. I'm going to see what everybody else says about that because it's a, it's a bit of a tricky one. Here's what I will say though. There's a very different rhythm to the speech on, I think you'd be hard pressed to find anyone who didn't care for John. So the rhythm for me changes on that sentence. And let's look at that sentence. It's all via the negative. It's all negative. You could say the same thing by saying, I and everyone cared for John. You could say it that way. The way she says it is, I think you'd be hard pressed to find anyone who didn't care for John. Two, so it's very negative. It's detached and it's distanced. And that doesn't sound too good, I would say. Chase, what do you got on this one? Very similar notes. Uh, but w one of the things is she starts nodding before the question is over. Uh, we don't see this very often, hardly ever in guilty people. And she's nodding to the rhythm of her speech. And people being deceptive find this almost impossible. And uh, still, she's not making a denial here. And the statements that uh, I'm referring to were not openly remarking about anyone's guilt uh, directly in words. So her statement about getting the, the truth out there is surprising if she's guilty. And what we see so often in guilty people is avoidance and redirection to their innocence and injecting more ambiguity into the narrative to just muddy the waters. The behavior I'm seeing in this clip uh, at the end here is fluid. It's flowing. There's no loss of uh, words. There's no loss of fluency like I just had there. And none of the other 55 hallmark behaviors that we tend to look for in people who committed a crime and are then lying about it on camera. Or her head nodding emphasis on emotional words and usage of his name, using his name, is all very congruent. And what I would expect to see in a situation like this, one might say it's as it should be. And again, keep in mind, as we're going through these clips, I can't speak for everybody, but I will be using the five C's in a hierarchical order. I'm looking for changes to behavior, clusters, context, culture, and then the checklist, all the known deceptive behaviors, even though those don't exist. That'll be the last thing that I'm really looking for. So in each video we look at, I'm going to give you a tip to make sure you ask better questions in your life or if you're a reporter talking to somebody who's a suspect of something. So the first one is develop a baseline. Ask a few basic questions at the beginning of the interview, where somebody went to college, what they do for a living, how they met their partner, 
So allow their natural behavior when they're telling the truth to be visible before you start digging. Scott, what do you got? Um, <clears throat> we got a couple things going against us. Uh, number one, this video is so choppy, it's ridiculous. It's um, it's and it's the most Botox we've ever seen in <laughs> uh, on somebody on our show. I've never seen so much. I don't think in person in life. I don't think I've seen somebody with so much Botox <laughs> as as her in this one. So it's really hard to see any emotions. There are no micro expressions whatsoever in this anywhere. I agree with you, Chase. Those uh, confirmation nods as she's talking, that's, that makes total sense. When you um, when you look at those, quite often people think that means she's saying yes when she's supposed to be saying no and that kind of thing. But it's just confirming what she's saying. Her voice, tone, and volume never change. It's a, it's really loud. And it's really, it's it's almost a lot. It's almost like a she's locked on to one volume and one tone and just stays there the whole time. So that that's kind of, I, I, I haven't seen that for a long time. I've seen it a few times, but this for me is odd, but I don't know if it's odd for her because we don't, we have no idea what her baseline is. There's no chance for that because these videos, like I was saying before, are so choppy. And which means we're going to have to focus a lot on what she says, as opposed to uh, how she acts or reacts to things from a body language perspective. Greg, what do you got? So let's talk a little bit about what happens when you're in front of a jury, because at the end of the day, that's what really matters here. It doesn't matter what we say in this thing. But what she's going to have to be careful of is she is not a warm person in this interview. I don't, I don't care who you are. She's intense. When intense is OK. People, some people are intense. Others aren't. But I see no grief, no sorrow, no sadness when she's talking about because he's dead. The only thing I see is aggravation at why they're questioning her. And that is not a good look when you're sitting in front of a jury. Doesn't matter. And I said this when we were doing a news piece. Look, you need to humanize yourself. I don't care if that's who you are. You need to humanize yourself. So when I don't see that, I then want to start looking for other places. She may start to leak a little information and that kind of thing. We, I, I also think, Mark, I'm just going to hit two things because mm -hmm. I, I can't say enough how choppy this one was. And the only reason we haven't done it to now is because it's this is all there is. But when she's talking about you would hard, be hard pressed to find someone who doesn't think he's the patron saint or whatever it was. I see a little contempt or disdain or something. Did he give too much time to other people? Don't know. But something in that face right there, there's also the possibility because the way she speaks and the way she moves, that that's residual in the way she holds her face. Again, when you look at nine second clips or 22 second clips, this is really, really hard. And her eye rolling is just illustrator. So I think we got to be careful not to assign anything to her eye rolling and movement. What we have to do is look for a pattern. We're going to get a baseline, the best we can do here. This is, again, the baseline in this interview, which is chopped to hell. The one place I wish they would not have cut is when she was so annoyed at, when she said, because he's dead and there was a cut in there. Man, that would have been great just to leave that little bit alone. But good start. This is what we got. This is what we're going to show you. She needs to be cautious. That's all I got. What do you think is the best? Uh, this is one of the worst as far as choppy goes, things being chopped up. What's the best one we've seen where it wasn't choppy? Hmm. Um, had just the full on it was recent we had a really good one and i think we commented on that how it's not focusing on the person uh, pierce morgan viewing yeah pierce morgan's always really good, good. Yeah. i mean yeah, the prince andrew, uh, yeah. oh, yeah. a, andrew uh interview is a is a that was is a great one i mean that's, well, that's well shot and spacey just did an interview with pierce morgan we'll do again here shortly where he talks about that's being great. on a plane with bill clinton epstein and young and underage girls so yeah 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 yeah. yeah. Wow. Where's <laughs> yeah. this? When did this happen? Uh, yesterday, the day before. Yeah. 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 We'll do, it's we'll good. Do it next it's a great week. interview. We'll yeah, do it next week. One of, one of Piers's best, actually. Yeah. You've seen yeah. it? It's pretty. I have, yeah. It's very good. Yeah. We'll do it next very week. Good. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, very good. All right. You're alleging that law enforcement officials in this state committed murder and that they're covering it up. Why would they want to be involved in this? Because he's dead. I, I think things went too far. It was late. There was alcohol involved, but they're all family, and there's there's many of them involved. After posting bail, Reed has spent much of the past 18 months in and out of court awaiting a trial date. 
And me and my family and my attorneys and my team have marshaled every resource to get to the truth. It just feels like no one else wants it. Prosecutors allege that Rita hit O'Keefe with her car after getting into an argument earlier in the day, leaving him to die in the middle of a snowstorm in January 2022. But Reed says she had no reason to harm her boyfriend. I would call him the patron saint of Canton. He was just very selfless, frugal, and I think you'd be hard pressed to find anyone that didn't care for John. Did you meet up again? He had reached out to me on Facebook and he said, hey, blast from the past, how's things? And when I saw his picture, his profile picture was with several young children, and then it triggered my memory that his sister and his sister's husband had passed away. And uh, he told me, yeah, I have the kids now. I admired that. Um, I thought that was amazing. Soon, Reed says she became part of the family, often sleeping over at O'Keefe's house and helping take care of the kids. He would go to work and I would stay with his niece and nephew. All of the breaks that the kids had, we did something. But their relationship also had its struggles. Reeve says O'Keefe had been relying more on her to take care of the kids and that he criticized some of the decisions she made with them. We had had an argument on New Year's Eve. They were on vacation and he became incoherently drunk. And I ended up ringing in the new year with his niece and nephew. John didn't come back to our room till after 3 a.m. So that was rough. I felt very much taken, taken advantage of. He apologized profusely for what happened on New Year's Eve. And he said, if you can't get over it, then you need to spend some time in your house. I, I can't keep apologizing. I don't want to keep rehashing this. All right, Greg, what do you got? I'm really short on this one. The eye rolls are emphatic with her. There's sacred space when she's talking about the kids. I think there's probably some, and she tells us, she's going to tell us there's some baggage around how he treated her about how she treated the kids and that kind of stuff. But we see that. We see her starting to adapt, do that sacred space. I always talk about closing your hands in front of you and rubbing your hands together. We're seeing her releasing nervous energy, trying to adapt, trying to make the uncomfortable comfortable. And then she does a real adapter when she's talking about that argument on New Year's Eve. So there's some baggage here. The thing is, just because there's baggage here doesn't mean that she killed a guy with a car. So if anybody who tells you, well, she rubbed her neck when she's talking about him, so she must have killed him. We call that absolutist, and we know that's BS. Chase, what do you got? Totally agree. I was I watched that this part so many times today, and I thought she bought a new dress. Maybe there's a tag in there, and right. you know, we have no idea. But when she's talking about Facebook and, and uh, him reaching out to her, She's genuinely smiling and recalling this at the precise emotional point where we would expect. And it's not a full smile. And I'm saying it's not a full smile because that's even harder to fake. This little partial smile at that exact moment is harder to fake because if we're faking smiles, we want to telegraph it. We want people to see it. And she says, I admired that. I thought it was amazing about the kids. There's genuine chin boss movement, which we typically associate with genuine grief or shame or just seeing something that we're feeling down about. And when you see this with downward gazing, it's a great indicator of some kind of grief because you're seeing a cluster and not relying on one single behavior. One thing guilty people will do is disparage the victim. We see this over and over again, especially if you're a subscriber to the channel, you've seen it a lot. They'll provide reasons to dislike the person who's been murdered, albeit pretty covertly and subtly. What they won't hardly ever do is go into a story about the victim doing something irresponsible, then launching into how profusely they apologized for it and how they continue to apologize over time. The way she's explaining all this has smooth cadence emotional tone shifting up and down at the right moments and maybe her intensity and we talk about anger all the time like innocent people will be angry if they're charged with a crime or accused of something that could be an explanation for the intensity here sorry the my wife and daughter just sp spun by on the four-wheeler uh, out the window <laughs> <laughs> distracted speaking of intensity yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but her hands are in sync with the words uh, she does, and Scott will do a. We'll show you that maybe, hopefully, in a minute uh, mm -hmm. when it happens on specific. I can't remember something, but everything looks like I might expect it to be. And her eye contact is the same as her baseline. So, with the second tip here, if you're a reporter, you're interviewing somebody, 
ask more open-ended questions. These require more detailed responses and increase the cognitive load. This is the mental processes on the interviewee. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, okay. I think maybe you're confusing her her almost melodic, uh, what do you, how do you say it, her, um, her voice changing like that. I think we're just, we're hearing a volume change in there because her tone doesn't change. It's all like that most of the time. And it's, I, uh, I'm not getting it. Could you give us like a three second instead of a... <laughs> yeah. yeah. How does it sound again? Just, well, it's, it, it's harsh. It's a harsh okay. sound. What's that Boston yeah. accent too that goes with it? Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh man. Right. Yeah. It, it's hardcore and it's Rough. spot on. I lived there for a long time and it was oof. So there's, we obviously see that big adapter, but I'm with you guys. It could be most anything, but it does show up when she's talking about the uh, fight they were having. But I don't, I don't think that would be the, I'm not, that bothers me as using that as an adapter or seeing that as an adapter, calling it as one. But I think there is stress there with that. So maybe that's what it is. It's just, it's a tough call on that one. She has this really strange tick where her eyes get real wide like that, you know? Um, and we see her hands. She's adapting with her hands. So that's definitely going on. But that could be from nervousness because she's being interviewed. She's having to relive this situation that, that she's being accused of. So there's that. So right now, it's, you know, it could go either way for me at this point. Um, and when she said, but, the thing with that makes it way more toward maybe something's up here is when she, when she talks about him telling her he doesn't want to start rehashing this thing they've, they've gone over before. That's what they're fussing about is how she keeps bringing stuff up that he did, that he got in trouble for. And he says to her, and she said, he said, I don't want to keep rehashing this. So maybe it's one of those things where she just keeps talking to him and bugging him and maybe he's just not into it. Maybe she resents him because I'm feeling like she's resentful toward him for the way things sound. So I don't think their relationship is solid. And I think she's resentful because he he's out drinking and hanging out with his buddies and stuff. And she's home watching the kids and they're not even her kids. So I think that might um, weigh into this as well. But still, it's a little 50-50 for me right now. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. There's there's milling around. So there's stress, but it's, it's pretty consistent throughout. You know, there's no massive changes. Um, the, the, the potential adaption on the shoulder there, it comes at the right time if you take into account the word argument. So I agree with that. But Chase, just like you say, it could be, could be, you know, could be anything, could be anything. But, you know, surely there should be a little more stress over the idea of argument. So it doesn't seem unreasonable. It, you know, you're not going to go, oh, she's lying about the argument. No, it suits the idea of argument. Is she lying about something else? Well, nothing else comes at that point. So, yeah. You know that that seems to fit for me. I'm I'm okay with that. I do sense a little bit of change in rhythm and cadence within. Stay with his niece, niece and nephew. Stay with. In that, there's a change. There's a subtle change. Do I think there's something up there? No. I think I think it's stress because she is resentful of this she's setting up a story there of of resent she's 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 clear that she didn't like um being left in charge of that and being given uh, that that maybe it was presumed she would take responsibility for that sounds fair um interesting uh incoherently drunk there's a change in rhythm there OK, so there's now a little more of a story of here's this person that presumes you're going to look after the kids. You get incoherently drunk at times. And then she says, taken, taken advantage of. And there's a loss of fluency there. She says, taken twice. There's a little thought in there. But again, that loss of fluency seems to fit the whole story that she's setting up there, which is she's now... Well, is she being forced into with the questioning to give a representation of I had a guy who wasn't really, you know, behaving as he should behave, was getting out of hand now and again. And I think I was being I felt like I was being taken advantage of. I think everything that we're hearing in the subtle changes and they're really subtle that are happening there, they seem to fit. So I don't think there's any um, any deception going on here. It's more emotionally accurate for what she's talking about. However, this story there then does really set up this person as not the potential angel who she doesn't think anyone would not 
you know, uh, like being around. It's kind of twisted the story slightly to, but he wasn't perfect. And so, you know, in my view, I'd like to see where are we going to go with this? Is that it's going to move further? Because to your point, Chase, are we starting to see a little bit of a gear shift, a subtle volume change into demeaning this person because we've got to set this person up um, as a perpetrator of something and reposition herself as a victim of something? We see that often happening with people who are guilty of something. Is it going to happen here? It started to get a little more interesting for me now. Yeah, that's all I've got on that one. Uh, no, that was Greg. Greg mm. gave 14%. No, look at that expression on his face, man. He's like, <laughs> made me laugh. <laughs> Greg, wow. <laughs> Greg exerted wow. about 14% more effort than usual there. That's so, about right. Yeah, that's about, about 40. Right. <laughs> Which is 12%. I'll agree to give to Greg. <laughs> yeah. Right. I'll, I'll mark yeah. it down in the lean uh, tracker. Do. Do. Let it show okay. in the record. How did you meet up again? He had reached out to me on Facebook and he said, hey, blast from the past, how's things? And when I saw his picture, his profile picture was with several young children. And then it triggered my memory that his sister and his sister's husband had passed away. And uh, he told me, yeah, I have the kids now. I admired that. Um, I thought that was amazing. Soon, Reed says she became part of the family, often sleeping over at O'Keefe's house and helping take care of the kids. He would go to work and I would stay with his niece and nephew. All of the breaks that the kids had, we did something. But their relationship also had its struggles. Reeve says O'Keefe had been relying more on her to take care of the kids and that he criticized some of the decisions she made with them. We had had an argument on New Year's Eve. They were on vacation and he became incoherently drunk. And I ended up ringing in the new year with his niece and nephew. John didn't come back to our room till after 3 a.m. So that was rough. I felt very much taken, ad taken advantage of. He apologized profusely for what happened on New Year's Eve. And he said, if you can't get over it, then you need to spend some time in your house. I can't keep apologizing. I don't want to keep rehashing this. Both times I met Brian Albert, he, he seemed like the type of person that you'd be surprised he's out socially because he doesn't seem like he ever wants to be there. But at the bar, Reed says there was an invitation to continue hanging out at Albert's home. I said, can we make sure we're welcome here? Nobody extended the invite to me. I didn't hear the invite extended to you. They drive to the Albert's house. What happens next is disputed. So I pull at the foot of the driveway. It's snowing. John has no coat on. It's windy. So I drop him off. He goes up the driveway and approaches the side door. And as I see him approach the door, I look down at my phone Reed says after about 10 minutes of waiting in her car, she became irritated that O'Keefe still hadn't gotten in touch with her. And she drove back to his home where she continued calling him before, she says, she fell asleep around 1.30 in the morning. She then says she woke up before 5 a.m. He still wasn't home. She then started canvassing the neighborhood. Just going to drive around in the two square miles that we spent the preceding night. All right, Chase, what do you got? This clip starts off with her baseline. She's talking the same way, moving her head the same way, and everything all the way down to her blink rate, which is how often we blink. We blink more when we're stressed out. is all the same. Uh, and she's talking about making sure they're welcome at this, this house party. And she goes to talk about the evening. A few changes occur while she's talking about the evening. And you all probably pick up on top of more of these. There's a detail spike, a huge spike in the amount of information going into this. Keep in mind, uh, I think a, a reasonable, normal person is going to increase detail spikes on things that make them innocent when they're in the middle of a trial if they're accused of something that especially that they didn't do. So there's a the detail spike. There's more staccato shift in her speech. It's more choppy. The gestures are more sharp and immediate, but they're still in sync with her words. There's a huge increase in detail about the driveway and the door. The driveway and the door, a ton of detail that you're going to see when this clip comes back on. And there's a shift present tense instead of past tense. 
for this whole description. Once the detail increases, everything is present tense. He goes into the house. He walks up there. I'm texting him, all of that kind of stuff. Then we have the phone calls. I'm no forensics expert, but if these calls were made that she's talking about in the video, it's very likely she didn't know his whereabouts. And placing all of these calls hints at more toward in, uh, innocence, especially when you factor in the mental state somebody would be in having just committed a snap judgment murder. The phone calls are hard to calculate in. So when she said we're driving around in these two square miles that we spent the preceding night, that's way out of baseline. Her shoulders are up, which to her credit is pretty common when somebody in a Western country is explaining themselves. Like we do this when we're explaining our actions and our behaviors. We put our shoulders up and the gestures are no longer matching or in sync with her speech at this point. Then there's an asymmetrical shoulder shrug or a single shoulder shrug, which is potentially lacking some confidence there. But I will admit that it's not a huge cluster. Keep in mind, there was a cluster there but it's not near enough as where I would call anything certain. And it's hard when we're not in control of the questions. If you're a reporter and you've got an yeah. interview to do like this, and it's a big interview, give us a shout, shoot us an email. We will make you the most incredible list of questions that you've ever seen to get some information out. So uh, technique number three, if you're a reporter doing interviews, repeat the key questions. So ask the same question at different times in different ways to start spotting inconsistencies in somebody's story. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, okay, so there is a story here. There's a, another character that comes in, uh, surname of Albert, can't remember his first name, but Albert. And here's the narrative that's put forward um, that she's worried, uh, are they welcome? in his home and also back in the bar a sense of he's somebody who doesn't look like they want to be social so set up as somebody who's antisocial and masking that antisocial uh persona and we're worried are we going to be welcome in this person's home so interesting character is brought in of an antisocial uh, person who will mask. I mean, I don't know whether that's true or not, but it's an interesting character and narrative to bring in. Let's see what happens with that. So she says, I drop him off. Oh, by the way, it's great to see, I, again, it's not, not easy to find a baseline of the interviewer, but the interviewer is there like like this huge yeah. huge furrows in his forehead yeah. she has no furrows in in her forehead but listening to her voice and listening to her intonation and the way she tells this story and the, the anxiety is the wrong word but the intensity is the right word as, as, as was used before the intensity with which she tells the story with nothing happening in her forehead which i i, I assume is going to be botox doing that um yeah, anybody would mirror that. Anybody would be there going, really, this happened? Yeah, so amazing to see that that mirroring going on there. Um, anyway, she says, I drop him off, and then we get, Chase, to your point, a spike in detail, which helps us understand why he would die of hypothermia. We get to hear about the snow, and, the, and that wasn't really in the questioning. Really? Yep. So, you know, what's that about? Because it, it, it is quite nice how it sets up in advance. Oh, here's why he might be found in the snow dead, because there's the possibility of hypothermia set up in advance. Now, what's interesting for me in the story that she tells, she doesn't see him go through the door. She sees him walk up to the door and then she's looking down, checking her phone. And ultimately, that has to be the last she ever saw of him. She doesn't see him, as she describes, go into the house. And yet there's con some concern about this, but I guess there's an argument going on at the same time, I guess. So So it, it's, it's unsure exactly what went on here. Why didn't you watch him go in? If, if concerned, why didn't you see him? go in why did you decide to drive off at that moment why look at your phone and not see him go on it, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me but we we don't get a chance to ask any questions so you know it our our understanding kind of um uh leaves us there uh, that's all i got on that one uh scott what you got 
Yeah, one of my favorite things in the world is is lateral logic, those little puzzles you get, you know? <laughs> yeah, you know yeah. Steve and, and Kendra died, you know, whatever, but they were goldfish and they, you know, they flipped out of the, that kind of thing. They're real simple, but they're they're really great. So I really like those. And she has, she's not trying to do it on purpose, but this, what this is, is sort of turned into because th we have a picture of our, in our mind of him going in the house. And you're right, Mark, because she says, I watched him approach the door. She didn't, I mean, which is something odd to say, you yeah. know, that sounds odd to me. I, she, I mean, she, I saw him approach the door. Really? Well, you know, no kidding. But she didn't say she saw him go in. But you assume he did because she what you that's what we've all done for years and years. Growing up, you walk up to a door and you go right in it. So I think that's odd, especially since they've been fighting up to that point. Because he got out of the car and he was mad. And she was mad too. Because she talks about how they were fussing in there. She talks and that's so loud. Unnecessary language. Like There's when, I, a lot of that in this when I first started yeah. learning writing, I wrote this sample paragraph and I was like, he reached out his hand. To, oh, to turn the doorknob and the feedback I got back was like, was there another body part that that person was going to use? <laughs> you just say, well, he's going to open the door, right? He opens yeah. the door. Yeah. And you're yep. absolutely right. That's, I heard that exact yeah. same thing in there. Yeah. Steve Coogan does that, Mark, in, in some of his things where he, where you can tell he's the one supposed to be filming it and setting it up because it shows him going out to the car, putting his hand on it, opening it up, putting the key in, turning it and all that. And all he's doing is going to the car and leaving. It's right. hilarious. <laughs> So anyway, she talks so loud, it's like she's yelling the whole time. It's, I mean, her volume goes way up and her cadence stays the same. It just, the tone and cadence just go dink and just keep going hey, the whole time. I, it's, it's hard to listen to her. I think that's why he's got that, that guy's look on his face because it's so loud, maybe. I don't like loud things. And she is, I, I think that may be bugging him. That's what it looks like to me anyway. But she does say she's mad at him. And then she's so mad at him. Because he hasn't texted her for 10 minutes or something, she goes home. She decides to go home after dropping him off. And then she wakes up and goes out hunting for him at 5 o'clock in the morning. She doesn't go back to the house where she left him. She doesn't start there. That's the last, literally the last place she goes is to the house where she left him, right? If your wife, if you get mad at your wife for whatever reason, if you're going to do that, I could do it. And then leave and... You wouldn't expect her to be walking home through the neighborhood or anybody else. Why would you be canvassing the neighborhood? It's ridiculous. You wouldn't be, but you need an excuse. So that to maybe sober up or something, but whatever the, the excuse is. But that's odd. That's really odd to be out canvassing the neighborhood when your husband's missing or when you well, you know where you left him, but you don't go there first. So that I thought that was really odd. Uh, this just isn't rational. Uh, thinking a thought going into this it's a great story and she's doing a great job but taking it into consideration what you two guys have said so far and i'm sure greg may add to it this doesn't sound like it it happened this way at all it sounds like she got mad and then he got out of the car and she left maybe something happened between the time she left or whatever who knows that's where that's why we're sitting where we're sitting greg what do you got so I'm going to add one more one more data point. We always talk about lies of omission being and then. Well, she says, I watched him approach the door and then I looked at my phone. Okay, what happened between? Now, this is a micro interview. This is the only reason that you would do this is because she used a time hiding phrase or time hiding uh, pause there. What I would do is say, okay, let's talk about that. What happened between the time you saw him at the door and tell me exactly where he was and the time you looked at your phone? Well, nothing. Okay, good. Then we'll just keep moving on. But if, in fact, she backed over him and didn't include that, then we would miss that. So we have to, anytime somebody's hiding time, we have to go through it. But I'm on the same page. You guys all are. Let's also talk about her for just a minute. I want you to go back and watch these videos and listen for where the intensity in her discussion is. It's never around facts. It's always around people. I would venture to say this woman is probably really intense with people and may not be liked by some of his cop buddies, number one, because all the details, listen to that. When she's talking about this cop and he wasn't really a people person, there's a ton of detail that's not necessary there. She could have just said, I didn't really like him. And, and then she says the two times we met, there's a whole lot of details. There's not a whole lot of details about the house. I watched him approach the door. We're all on the same page. He never said he went through. That's an allusion to something. Let him do it. And there's logic failure here around not, not going back to the house. And the first time we have heard her stammer, she's well-spoken. She's like a machine, bam, 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 yep. bam, until she gets to that point about canvassing the two miles and then she stammers. 
That don't look good. Now we got a cluster. And one of my favorite things we don't see often enough on here is she turtles when she does it. Mm. And we say turtling, her neck is shrinking down in her head, protecting, Chase, you talk about all the time. One of our first things that we do is protect all those arteries to protect us from being killed by cats, I think Joe said. But this whole thing feels like she's timeline masking. Does that mean she killed the guy? Don't know. But what that does make me think is she might not even remember exactly what's happening. There if this go. video were not so edited, we would have a better feel. But one of my favorite things, she just locked herself into the most finite time frame on earth. Because when she says, he walked to the door and I looked at my phone, you know what my next question would have been? What time was it? Because that's the first thing she would have seen on her phone. And then I would be able to go back and timestamp and prove whether she's telling the truth or not. She's put herself in, in a box right here. And if they get her on the stand and somebody does this and starts locking her down here, it'll be interesting to see what kind of data they have to back it up. This is the first time I thought, hmm, maybe something happened. In the beginning, you're like, okay, she's grumpy. She's kind of you know, intense. But she, this makes her not look believable to me right here. That's all I got. Oh wow, there's two new ones there. Chase, that yeah. was good. Mark, this whole this whole looking like a scholar thing. Let's yeah. go with that. I also also because <laughs> I knew I knew my hands would catch the light. That sun, yeah, man. Yeah. Oh, there you go. That sun. You got to go and I, just I finding think... look at that. Just finding the light. <laughs> Both times I met Brian Albert, he, he seemed like the type of person that you'd be surprised he's out socially because he doesn't seem like he ever wants to be there. But at the bar, Reed says there was an invitation to continue hanging out at Albert's home. I said, can we make sure we're welcome here? Nobody extended the invite to me. I didn't hear the invite extended to you. They drive to the Albert's house. What happens next is disputed. So I pull at the foot of the driveway, it's snowing, John has no coat on, it's windy, so I drop him off, he goes up the driveway and approaches the side door. And as I see him approach the door, I look down at my phone. Reed says after about 10 minutes of waiting in her car, she became irritated that O'Keefe still hadn't gotten in touch with her. And she drove back to his home where she continued calling him before, she says, she fell asleep around 1.30 in the morning. She then says she woke up before 5 a.m., he still wasn't home. She then started canvassing the neighborhood. Just gonna drive around in the two square miles that we spent the preceding night. How soon was it when you pulled in there that you saw John's body? Immediately. And what struck me when I saw him was his mouth was open a little bit and his eyes were shut and he had spots of blood in different areas on his face. O'Keefe was taken to the hospital and pronounced dead. He died from blunt force trauma and hypothermia. And it wasn't long before Reed became the number one suspect. Authorities say they had noticed a cracked taillight after they seized her car. I had told both Jen and Carrie that I cracked my taillight. I said I just hit my car on top of everything, but I didn't look at the damage. And both women said, it's cracked, it's cracked. Calm down, you cracked your taillight. You're okay, let's go look for John. All right, Greg, what do you got? So if you go back and look at video three, the video we just did, and I know Terry's, but th if you go back and look at video three, you'll see the only time she furrows her brow in this entire thing is about the interchange between her and the other cop. We don't see her furrow her brow. She has the capability, but it has to be something pretty intense for her. Well, pretty intense would be about finding your dead boyfriend. In my opinion, I would think we'd see something, something, nothing. Now, does that mean she killed him? No. Could mean that she was so angry and it's been two years and, 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 and. But if you just look at that one intensity, that one single intensity is around a personality issue with somebody she does not like. And this doesn't show it. The other thing is there's an out of baseline response to the question for how soon did you see his body? To this point, she's been pretty good at pause, answer, boom, immediately before the question's even out of the guy's mouth. That's different. Something's different. There's also a change in eye contact as he starts talking about the cracked taillight. When he starts talking about the cracked taillight, you see that eye lock that we haven't seen to now. So here's the thing. We don't know. This could be an and story, not an or story. Uh, did you back over him or did you hit a car? Could be an and story, not one or the other. And 
it could be that she backed into the car. And there's this will be interesting to see how the how the prosecution plays it out and how the defense plays it out, because their stories are wildly different. If you're watching, the prosecution is saying she backed into him. She went home, did all this and backed into a car and came back and had her friends look for two miles. And the the um, defense is saying, no, these cops killed him, beat him to death in the basement and took him upstairs and left him out. So this is an interesting kind of one for us to look at. And there's no real smoking gun. Again, all this edited video, you're gonna, you guys are going to see a ton more stuff than I even just brought up. But the two things to pay attention to, well, three things. There's no forehead involvement, although she had it for the last guy. There's an out-of-baseline response to that question, and there's a change in eye contact. I would really be interested in asking her why. And I have a theory, but I'm not going to bring it up yet. Scott, what do you got? All right, let's, let's not forget what we're talking about here. She is drunk. She's mad. She's out driving around, backing into things, hitting cars or whatever it is she hit. So did she uh, leave a note on the car? Obviously not. Whatever she hit, she didn't it's, even get out and check it to see what the damage was. So what's car. up with that? It's her car. It's her car. She backed into her own car? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, then, okay. Wrong about that. Where did you hear that? She said she backed into her car earlier. In the, oh, okay. In the, Okay. Well, anyway, so there she is backing into things. And so that apparently breaks her tail. I don't have a problem with that. That's fine. But what? why is she, again, I'm going to go back to why is she driving around this neighborhood doing that? What, why doesn't, why doesn't she just go right to the house? This, this whole thing for this one, I have such a little part in this because it's, I hate to say it seems obvious to me, but at this point I'm, you know, I'm kind of in on things are looking fairly iffy for her. The, the, the picture she's created doesn't sound plausible to me, the way we're looking at all this. Chase, what do you got? I'm going to just try to stick only in behavior. And her language that she uses is associative language. She says his eyes, his mouth, his face, instead of the mouth or just there's snow on that mouth or the, the mouth was covered in snow. And associative language can suggest a personal connection or a deep emotional engagement with the subject. There could be reasons that she's not emotional about this story. She's told it 500 times. She's going to court. She's getting prosecuted for it or charged with murder for it. We don't know. There's a very strange shift here, though, in her behavior. And it's a shift from her baseline. There's a massive increase in the speed of her gestures. There's a shift of focus to details about innocence, which I will give her. There's it, it's contextual because she is being directly asked about this. I think uh, she uses all the people's names, including John's, which is a good sign. But something is off here. She's not once used any of this behavior before, but this deviation from baseline isn't as severe as maybe thousands of times that we've seen in other people that were guilty. It's just not not that severe as what we usually see. Uh, and pro tip number four, if you're an interviewer, focus on the details. Ask about specific times, places, and actions to increase stress. I don't think he directly asked her the question, did you do this in this interview? I don't see, I didn't see it. And as a quick bonus, ask the bait question. If you're a reporter, get good at the bait question. Here's all you need to do if you're a reporter. Is there any reason that someone would come forward and say blank? Or is there any reason that blank, a video, whatever, audio recording, whatever, might surface in the future? That's it. That's the bait you question. You ruined my number five. I was told my whole thing's about, about the bait question. <laughs> For number five. You know, it's funny. I wish you could see mine because my number five actually says plant to get a bait quest and start to work. That's, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. We all are on this one. Well, look, Chase, I'll, I knew you'd bring I'll it up. I'll just be doing number five then. I'll just. <laughs> just be That's Mark. only one of my points. <laughs> just be yeah. me. Great call. I knew you would do it. <laughs> Mark, what do you got? Yeah. Um, look, here's what isn't associated here is, is for me, any good reasoning as to why the tail light is cracked. She just puts forward, you know, uh, that I cracked my tail light. But um, so we've got we've got a who like she, you know, it, it well, that I cracked my tail light. So that could be associative to my car and my tail light. My car's tail light is cracked, not that she actually cracked it. Um, but 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 why? Like when? Where exactly? We've got a what, 
We've got a what, which is a cracked tail like, but exactly why, where, when, that we don't have. Uh, you know, so what so why even this detail? Why is it even pertinent? Why is it pertinent that she says anything about the tail like? She's looking for her, her boyfriend, uh, she's got friends with her. We gotta get this person found. Oh, by the way, I've cracked my tail like. What, what's pertinent about that? Unless you're setting up a story. You need, unless, now I'm not saying that that's happening. I'm just confused as to why it's pertinent at all. And then why, if it is pertinent, you know, the friends don't go, well, how'd you, how'd you do that? When, when did you do that? How? What, what? Well, I, you know, I did this. Why? Why did you back into that? Like what, what was going on with you? Well, I was drunk. I was really drunk. You know, there's no, there's so much missing here now. Uh, there's so much missing from the interview in general and who knows what questions were asked and what's missing. And and whether actually this is just a news item to make us go, well, there's stuff going on here and we can't answer the questions and it's just engaging. And actually in the raw footage there, all the answers are there. Who knows? Who knows? Because we don't get to see the raw footage. Yeah. It could be an absolute great teaser of a news item to make us all go, oh, I know what happened here. And actually yep. on the on the floor of the editing uh, studio, all the information is there. I don't know. But but certainly I'm I'm at a loss as to why mention the tail light and then why not give us more about that, but why mention in the first place. How soon was it when you pulled in there that you saw John's body? Immediately. And what struck me when I saw him was his mouth was open a little bit and his eyes were shut and he had spots of blood in different areas on his face. O'Keefe was taken to the hospital and pronounced dead. He died from blunt force trauma and hypothermia. And it wasn't long before Reed became the number one suspect. Authorities say they had noticed a cracked taillight after they seized her car. I had told both Jen and Carrie that I cracked my taillight. I said I just hit my car on top of everything, but I didn't look at the damage. And both women said, it's cracked, it's cracked. Calm down, you cracked your taillight. You're okay, let's go look for John. Firefighter said, that you said, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. I said, I hit him. It was preceded by a did and proceeded by a question mark. What I thought could have happened was that did I incapacitate him unwittingly somehow and then in his drunkenness passed out? When you walked out of the bar, how many drinks had you had? I had had probably about four. The Commonwealth says that you had nine drinks that night. That's what the prosecution says. I, I don't believe they're saying I wasn't in my right mind. I, well, they're well, saying you were intoxicated. Is it possible that you might have hit him unwittingly in your admittedly very large SUV? No, not possible. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. As a general rule, if you ever ask anybody how many drinks they had and they reply, I had had about four, then... <laughs> They had way more than four, like way more than four. Anytime you hear that, it's so many more than four. So, so we know, uh, and I think she does. She does. Um, uh, she maybe does change and give us a a, a, a better number. Oh no, no, the court, had, the the state or whatever had had worked out the intoxication to around about. Yeah. What did they say about nine or something like that? Nine. Yeah. Yeah. Which is either think- accurate or inaccurate, but but essentially. On a video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's way more than four. You know, it's way more than four. Um, so interesting. Did I incapacitate him unwittingly and then in his drunkenness pass out? So unwitting incapacitation, then in his drunkenness, he passes out. And then we've already got this story of hypothermia, essentially. So that if you add those stories together, it's it's much less likely that you can say, oh, you killed him because she unwittingly incapacitates him. And then it's his uh, drunkenness that causes his passing out. And then it's the, the earth that that freezes him and 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 kills him. So, you know, essentially nice method potentially of distancing herself from somebody's death. 
I'm not saying she murdered him, but good distancing from the death. Um, so an accidental hit, but his intoxication leads to death. Uh, probably about, about four. There's a lot of uncertainty there. Well, it's full of uncertainty, full of uncertainty, really. But then at the end, did she hit him? She says, no, not possible. So how can you have all that uncertainty and then at the end go, no, that's not possible? Because you've already asked the question, did I unwittingly hit him? So surely it's a possibility. The answer should be, yeah, as I stated before, I worry about the possibility of that. So doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And it's it's very, it's very energized, isn't it? It's very, very passionate. So is she protesting too much? Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? A couple of things that I noticed. Again, she's people focused. The reason she said, no, it's not possible is because he said, is it possible? She's feeding what he asked, exactly what he asked is the reason she said, no, it's not possible. She has way too much eye contact, way too much eye contact in this point. Scott and I had the thing in the true crime workshop called the romance where you're paying real close attention, making mm -hmm. sure the person is buying what you're doing. Even if you don't believe that, watch her eyes. As her head moves, her eyes stay locked on the guy. It's kind of crazy compared to the first one. There's another baseline deviation, Mark. You covered it, I love. How many you have? The, she even stumbles over four. Yeah. I won't go through all those pieces, but there's a long fishing vowel in there. There's a stumble over probably. There's a bout. How much more conditioning do you need? And then there's an entire baseline deviation in body language at four. She pulls her feet back under her. You know, we pull our resources under us when they're in danger. She pulls her feet back under her at one point when he starts poking on the issue. She doesn't answer the question when he says, they said you had nine drinks. If I hadn't had nine drinks and you said they said you had nine drinks, I'd say, that's a lie. No, I had four. I know how much it was. She doesn't. She says, they're not trying to say I wasn't in my right mind. Rest assured, unless you're nine feet tall and 600 pounds, nine drinks probably put you well over the legal limit to be driving a car. And you just admitted that whatever the case. Um, I, and I don't think she's a huge person to start with. Um, she avoids these questions. And then I think what happens is this kind of thing becomes kind of an existential issue for her. This is where I think the whole thing is hidden. She doesn't know what happened likely, because if you had nine drinks, it's going to be shadowy yeah. and it's going to be that kind of thing. I'm not saying you, but she would black out. We don't know that, but you would probably not have really good questions. And Chase, here's where I think the bait question would work wonderfully, not in this interview. But if I was sitting in a room and talking to her, I'd say, look, we know X happened. We know Y happened. Is there any reason, is there any reason any of his DNA would be on the back of that car? Is there any reason you might find something he was carrying at that moment? Is there any reason? In fact, what the state has said is that his cocktail glass has fragments of glass on the bumper of this vehicle. So there's a whole lot of that. And then you give her a lesser charge and she'd, you'd probably get her to back in because she is conditioning the hell out of whether or not she did anything. Mark, to your point, when a person does that, when they telegraph the earth did it and all this kind of thing, you probably can get that person with a bait question pretty quickly because they're starting to feel some kind of guilt or remorse or whatever. Doesn't mean she did this. We can't tell that. This is so chopped up. It's very, very tough. Chase, what do you got? I'm no forensics expert. Uh, I drive a Bronco. And if I stuck a piece of cocktail glass on my bumper and then deliberately back into another vehicle, I think that glass would fall off. I don't know. I'm pretty sure it would. But this one's interesting. First, we're seeing her in one moment stop using her name or even a pronoun to describe him. So as a quick lesson in the science of this, uh, with guilty people, the person's name is the first to start disappearing. Pronouns are the second thing to start disappearing. So there's two layers there. Both of them go away, but only for one minute. And it's only in one specific area when she says, did I incapacitate him unwillingly? And then in his drunkenness, like Mark was saying, passed out. Her hand reflexively goes to her chest here. I'm just afraid to hit my mic. So I would do what she did. But uh, and, and people tend to do this during three types of statements when they're being vulnerable, when they're more open than usual, or overly sincere. And I'll let you decide what you see right here. But here's why this video is interesting. Her deception about the number of drinks she had is so flipping obvious. There's a loss of fluency. There's hesitancy. There's lip compression. There's chin boss movement. There's immediate mouth closure following a statement, which we look for, and that is not in her baseline at all. 
and her eyes narrow, which is the opposite of this wide-eyed thing she's been doing her whole baseline time. Her eyes narrow, which isn't a common deception indicator until you have somebody with a baseline that have has this giant eyes things. Here's my question. If her deception about something as silly as drinks was so obvious that we could spot it from 100 yards away, where is the obviousness about the other stuff? Interesting here. Uh, it's just one data point. But there's chin boss movement, this little muscle right here about the grief and shame that we talked about earlier uh, at the end when she's saying it's not possible. So very interesting. Uh, it's starting to point to like, it looks more like someone who can't remember what they did or they're not sure about what they did. Uh, it, which, if it is a trap, if she is being framed, it's the perfect candidate. It's the perfect situation to do that in. So as a, as a quick pro tip here, number five, ask what happened in reverse order. Not from front to back, go back to front. This technique is effective because recounting events in reverse disrupts anything that's rehearsed, any narrative that's rehearsed. So it increases cognitive load and it makes it way more difficult for deceptive people to keep their story straight and it exposes inconsistency, inconsistencies and reveals the truth. So if you've rehearsed something forward 5,000 times, like the alphabet, it's still hard to say backwards. Scott, what do you got? I agree with you. And the key to get them to, to tell the story backwards, you don't say, okay, let's start from the back and go and, and go back to the front. You've got to do it subtly. You've got to start asking them questions and then scooch right up next to the end and say, Where, what was going on right before that? And you, and you do that for each part of that because the memories you have that happen in an event are all they're linear and they're locked together with emotions and the things that happen during those those times that's why you remember them in that in that uh linear fashion but when you take out the emotions you had at the end and you go to that block before that that emotion doesn't connect it this way it connects it that way or i guess the opposite if you got if you're uh, since i'm the other way around so that, yeah that's key i think that's really important um, I thought this would be a good uh, spot to to bring in the bait question. That's why my the whole thing was shot in the foot when mm. Chase mouthed off about it in the video before this. Like an ignoramus. <laughs> my aunt used to call it ignoramus. One pro tip, though, with that going backwards, if you're doing this, use your left hand and move to your right this is the way that their timeline works. So it in your timeline, you're going past to present, but you're going backwards for them. So as you're asking these questions, start moving your hands a little bit further to your right, and it helps them go backwards in time, and it makes it look more fluid and natural. Here's a pro tip. Stay out of my time. I'll just <laughs> sit on this. There's a pro tip. Yeah. Uh, where was I? I'm, I'm at the end here. So you guys covered everything. I could rehash and go over stuff, but it's going to be just mm. so boring again. I know I say that a lot, but I got nothing by the time you guys are done. But what? But I will tell you what bothered me when she says, um, "Could I have unwittingly incapacitated him?" I think that's important there. Which you very softly. I, yep. I think I think I think we're I think we're there. They are. I think Those are, are tough have, words to get out, aren't they? Unwittingly incapacitated, like because you know, her. Yeah, I, I used to listen to that band all the time. <laughs> her vernacular is that of an attorney or a cop. Mm. That's the way you know she's why? talking. Yep, because she was married or hanging out with one, and she hangs out with she's, an attorney, or she, maybe she's an attorney. She's also know. a financial analyst for for Fidelity. So she uh, works in that world. Uh, and I think she's no. been going through these proceedings for a while. Yeah. How long has this been going Oh, on? she's in Boston. She's in Boston. Yeah. Oh, I think so. Oh, oh I did. She know talks that. like it. Oh, and she says, they might, we marshal all of our support. Okay. Ah. Yeah. Everybody talks that way there. Um, I forget where it was. Anyway. Um, okay. You sent her vernacular, and I just thought I'd give you a data point. Oh, okay. You nailed it. All right. Firefighter said, that you said, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. I said, I hit him. It was preceded by a did and proceeded by a question mark. What I thought could have happened was that did I incapacitate him 
unwittingly, somehow, and then in his drunkenness, passed out. When you walked out of the bar, how many drinks had you had? I had had probably about four. The Commonwealth says that you had nine drinks that night. That's what the prosecution says. I, I don't believe they're saying I wasn't in my right mind. I well, they're all... saying you were intoxicated. Is it possible that you might have hit him unwittingly in your admittedly very large SUV? No, not possible. Let's talk about what we think has happened so far, what we've seen, and maybe if if you guys feel like it, tell what you think actually happened and what you think is going to happen. Don't feel like you have to, because these are remember these are just our opinions. That doesn't mean whatever we're going to say happened. It's just these are just our opinions. So, Mark, what do you, what have you seen so far? What do you think? Well, Mark look, here's what I'll say so far: is I don't think I've seen enough. I don't think there's enough there for me to really nail a color to a post and you know stand and salute it so but what so I, i'm really gonna be in the indecisive box here unfortunately and it's not that's not often the case but i have to say i'm indecisive now uh i don't there's some stuff that does not make sense and doesn't look good about this, but I'm not seeing enough of the other, the potential other side to really make a decision on this one. That's very disappointing. And I hate to be in that position, but that's just the reality of it. Uh, Chase, what are you thinking? I'm with you. I'm with you. And I, I mean, I try not to look at the case. I did today. It is some of the most bizarre, mm. crazy stuff. Uh, on the other side of this thing that uh, I have no words for. But her behavior shows a mix of genuine emotions and then signs of stress. She seems mostly sincere, but there are red flags, especially around her drinking, which might affect her memory uh, being intoxicated. So remember, and I just want to put this point out there as we're getting to this point, not seeing obvious signs of lying does not mean innocence. So we focus on what behaviors are present or missing. Sometimes the questions don't create enough stress to trigger fight or flight or, or any kind of the behaviors we might look for. And in this video, we couldn't even really hear the exact questions. Mm -hmm. but, and the editing is all over the place, which complicates stuff a whole lot for people like us. And as a final verdict, something is way off. <laughs> Something's way off. Uh, she might be unsure about what happened because she was too drunk. I'm going to err on the side of there's so much going on on the other side. And her behavior looks so fluid here in all the points that I would expect it to not. I would say she's most likely innocent. Or has zero memory of the entire event. Mm. That's Those are the two two right. outcomes. So yeah. she so might the, be guilty and she might be. <laughs> <laughs> well, the complete lack of memory is responsible yeah. for the That's, lack of emotion. Yeah. Greg, Thank what do you got? When I look at this whole thing, I, I wanted to find a video that was much better. This thing's so sliced up, we all said. It, yeah. it tells a great story. If you go watch this guy's interview, it tells a great story of what happened. That's what he's trying to do. It's an art form. What we're after is trying to find enough stressful video to ask the hard questions and for us to figure it out. We don't really get that here. The reason we did this is because we had so many people ask at CrimeCon. And what we want you to know here is we're going to give you our best judgment from here. I agree with you, Chase. I think what I said in this whole thing is it may be and not or. She may have backed into him and backed into a car because she was so inebriated. That would be my first guess, my first guess. And the only reason I mention that is because there are two big things, there are two big points. One is she is awfully evasive around him going in the house. We never hear he went in the house. There's a timestamp on that phone. There should be when she reaches down and touches it and starts poking around. And then she's evasive about going back to find him. That doesn't mean that she's lying. It mean, it might mean there's just a blot of time in there that her brain didn't register or she can't really recall. So we don't know either way. But there's a whole lot of missing and out of ordinary there. The other thing to watch her, go back and watch all of these videos. She is intense around people issues. She's not intense around what happened. So that tells you something about her personality. She's all people driven and that kind of thing. She's all about personalities and this person and this relationship and that. And she's very clear in those, but she's not clear in the details of what happened. 
Is it because alcohol obliterated her memory? Maybe. Is it because she's hiding something? Maybe. So I guess I'm back on the fence too. Scott, what do you got? All right. So uh, the thing that bothers me is she's being nonspecific in so many places, but then she gets super specific, but starts using that vernacular of, of a lawyer or a cop or, or whatever she's doing for a living. It's not what she, it's not the vernacular she's been using the whole time. See what I'm saying? So that seems out of place to me because the places she's using it are the places she's sort of protecting herself or would be using it to protect herself, to protect her story. That bo that bothers me. The most logical thing that happened would would be the most logical thing to happen from what she's explained. They were fussing. She said they were fussing when they got when he got out of the car. She didn't say she saw him go into the house. It all got weird in there in that little Keep in mind, we don't we don't know the details, you know. We're like we haven't yeah, we done the forensics. Mm. Right. right. Oh yeah, not at all. Yeah, and we, we just don't know what's on the cutting room floor as well. Exactly. Yeah, that's we the just, biggest question. Exactly. Uh, but you're right, Scott. Out, you know, this this news item yeah. causes you <laughs> to think, oh, I think I know what happened here. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and it could be right or it could be wrong, you know? Or somewhere yeah. in between. Or somewhere in between. <laughs> <laughs> As it I should mean, be. Yeah. I would you guys does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> and Scott, but, you paid attention to all the specific words and phrases in here. What do you think about yeah. those? <laughs> I think quite often you'll hear those, all of them. <laughs> if she's guilty, what would what what will the turnout will be? How's that? Would be they were mad and fussing and fighting. He got out and she backed over him and then went home. That's how mad she was. But uh, then again, I could be wrong. So, but there's also go. information out there that he has to get out of the car with a cocktail glass. <laughs> right. Oh, that's true too. So, right. Not that I probably well, haven't been there, but <laughs> I was going to say, not that any of us have not ever done that in our life. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Okay. No last word, Chase. Well, I think this was a good one, fellas. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you next time. So what do you got? Yeah. <laughs>